Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Curriculum and Evaluation Committee to order. Um, we are here in the Nashua High North Boardroom. It is 4.09 approximately on Thursday, January 20th, 2024. Uh, today's meeting was originally intended for Monday, but due to the snow day, it was rescheduled for today. Um, through the roll present, we have Ms. Giglio. Here. Uh, Ms. Pratt is not here. Ms. Daniels-Williams? Here. And Assistant Superintendent Dr. Sarf Day is here with us, as well as uh, an impressive panel of presenters, educators, and professionals in the pricing. Um, today we have uh, scheduled a series of presentations on uh, NUVA curriculum. Uh, teacher professional development, and a few other updates. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sarfi. Thank you so much. Okay, so tonight we have a couple of presentations, and we're going to start with an update on our Eureka Math Squared implementation. And Beth Wheeler is going to start us off, and we are joined by Amanda Cerrone and Amy Sayo. Um, I'm Beth Wheeler, and I'm the elementary um, instructional coach for the district for mathematics. Um, and we're just going to provide you with an update of the implementation of Eureka Squared, which has been um, rolled out K-5 district-wide this year, and provide an update on the continued education about how the brain learns math and how teachers and students can build thinking classrooms. And then we'll share teachers' um, will share students' experiences with Eureka Math Squared and how they use the curriculum resources to build thinking classrooms. So um, Eureka Math Squared has been fully implemented at grades K through five. Uh, various PDs have been offered up to this, professional developments have been offered up to this point to support teachers. Uh, a Power Up PD over the summer, which was offered by Great Minds, our publisher. Um, more PD was offered at the K-5 Institute over the summer, opportunities during the November PD day, and then teachers have been able to lean on the elementary mathematical instructional coach as their needs arose. So Eureka Math Squared is an updated version of the original Eureka curriculum resources that we were using. Um, they rewrote the curriculum to improve accessibility, coherence, and engagement. Um, there are supports built in for our multilingual learners and students with learning differences uh, in the teacher materials. Um, the coherence, I have more of this to come, but they have reorganized the scope and sequence to um, be more intentional intentional about making connections between mathematical concepts and being able to progress from pro conceptual learning to more con complex um, understandings. And then the Eureka Math Squared has brought in a um, digital component and um, redesigned their student-facing materials to become more engaging. Last year, um, Ed Reports conducted its, uh, shared its first report of the Eureka Math Squared materials. As you can see at every grade level, you can see K through two here, and then on the next slide, three through five. Um, they meet expectations in all eight ways. Next. And next, Amanda Cerrone is gonna share her teacher's experiences with the rollout at Maine Dunstan Elementary. I'm Amanda Cerrone, the principal at Maine Dunstable, and I just wanted to share a little bit about what the teachers and students are experiencing. Teachers and students at Maine Dunstable are thriving with the upgrades from the original Eureka Math to Eureka Squared. Teachers are impressed that Eureka Math Squared took everything that they loved about Eureka Math, such as consistent math models, rigor to support the productive struggle, and coherence across lessons, modules, and grade, and added a new level of flexibility and accessibility to all of their learners. Teachers can't say enough about the access Eureka Squared gives to their multilingual learners and students with learning differences. Teachers also appreciate that the materials are more user-friendly for both teachers and students. Teachers appreciate the variety, both of formative and summative assessments to track student progress. 
Teachers and students find that the addition of the digital components to the paper materials help to make learning more engaging. Even after only a half year's use, our data is indicating that Eureka Math Squared helps students establish a foundational understanding of mathematics, which is the why, rather than only relying on procedural skills which is the how. And they're seeing students strengthening reasoning and critical thinking skills that students can apply to solve real world problems and that can be applied to many real world situations. So while teachers have been using Eureka Squared um, tasks and so scope and sequence, teachers are also making the move to build thinking classrooms by, in, by adjusting their instructional practices. So I'd like the board member to consider these two pictures um, of brain pathways that are being made. And I'm just wondering, what do you notice and wonder about those two pictures? I just wonder if anybody would like to share. <laughs> you might notice that the picture on the left is showing more connections through those blue lines that are collect connecting blue dots to the red dots. Um, Eureka Math Squared has been improved to consider what we know as relational understanding to instrumental understanding. You can see relational understanding on the left and instrumental on the right. These pictures show what happens in the brain when a new concept is introduced with relational teaching, when relational teaching is used versus instrumental teaching. We can see that relational teaching is used, teaching is using more connections when a con among concepts is made. When we teach towards relational understanding, we are helping students make connections between mathematical concepts instead of them seeing them as isolated skills, which results in higher, results in students being able to learn mathematics at higher levels. We also know from the brain science that when students make a connection, make a students make and correct a mistake, a synapse is fired in their brains, to make those, relation, re, those relational connections. But we need to focus on the how, how to do this to give students opportunities to do, to do that thinking and make those mistakes. This is where the ideas of building thinking classrooms come in. Building Thinking Classrooms was a book that was written by Peter Lilladal, who is a professor of mathematics. And he spent 10 years conducting his research study where he observed, observed, observed in 40 classrooms over 40 different buildings. And in those 10 years, he noticed students did not, the majority of students did not seem to be doing the thinking for themselves. They were doing things such as faking, stalling, but most of all, mimicking the thinking their teachers were doing. When it came to trying it on their own, only 20% of students would try on their own, which was frustrating teachers and students. He also noticed that the institutional norms are are re were relatively the same in every classroom he visited, in every school he visited. So he wondered what would happen if he played with how classrooms looked and how material was presented. After months of gathering data on what changes promoted real thinking by students, he found that 14 factors or shifts that were implemented in instruction improved thinking student and, and achievement. You can see those 14 shifts on the side. When these factors are implemented in classrooms, what happens in the classroom dramatically changes. And this is an example of when these shifts are made in a classroom, how, we, how the student thinking shifts. Yeah, it would be so 
I can get like 10 in. This is an octagon. Because now one's the only two that think it's fake. It's, it's, it's true though, right? I wonder why these are fake. My dad went on the beach. I went on the beach. Maybe you're lying. National School District has continued to partner with Math Empowered to provide teachers with material with PD and materials to help make these instructional shifts. One of the materials that they provide and the PD that they have been provided is around math talks, which is what you just saw a video of a student interacting with. Um, I'd like to take a look as a math, at a math talk as a group. Next. And what happens with a math talk is students are given something to start their thinking about. And um, I'm just wondering if anybody who is mic'd would be willing to look at this picture and talk about what they notice and what they wonder. Are you asking us? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure because there were so many people here. Um, well, so so in seeing the way it's set up, one of the things that strikes me is it teaches them how to count by threes or by fives, um, and and they're actually, I don't know that they know they're multiplying yet, but they are. So what I'm hearing you say is that based on both of these pictures, we can either count by threes or we can count by fives. But what I'm wondering is, are we, is our result the same? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we can see that the result is 15 no matter what. But what I'm wondering is, how do we count to 15 in two different ways on this? Can anyone help share the two different ways that we count to 15? Rows and columns. That's great vocab. In our first picture, we see um, rows of three. We see five rows of three, five groups of three. Or in our second picture, we see five group, or excuse me, three groups of five, or five, or three rows of five. But our result is still 15. It's almost like the picture has been turned on its side, and we can count three times, five times three equals three times five. So I just want you to now consider, how did you learn about the commutative property in school, and when do you think that that happened? When I was in school in the 1950s <laughs> and early 60s, um, we learned by memorization. That was, it was all by rote. You had to memorize everything. So I'm, I'm most likely to say that most people in this room was given the definition of the community of property, memorized it, maybe on a quiz or maybe asked by the teacher, what's the definition of community of property? And they might have said A times B equals B times A. But that didn't mean that we conceptually understood it and could apply it to more thinking. Once students start to understand these concepts, they can build to find more math facts. In fact, I'm going to read a teacher testimonial uh, later that we saw students interacting with this math lab who didn't even know it, but they were talking about prime factorization. They were third graders. By the way, this is a third grade math talk, and that's not that um, concept doesn't really come up until sixth grade, but they were ready to do that thinking. And now Amy Seo is going to share her um, 
experiences with this. I'm Amy Sayo. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Charlotte Ave. And this is my um, first year doing Eureka Squared, as well as trying out Math Empowered. Um, and it was definitely a shift in my teaching. I was delivering, checking it in, circling back, trying to build knowledge. And I said, well, if I'm going to try a new curriculum, let's, let's try it all. I um, took advantage of the professional development offered by um, the math workshops, been particularly working with the Math Empowered group with Carolyn Worcester. And it was powerful to observe her in other classrooms as well as um, this year she came in to work with my kids and it was great to be able to stand back and listen to my kids and have somebody else guide them through. So what we do is we take the math talk, which is what you see in that first picture and what you guys just kind of experienced. And what I'm seeing my kids do is build their learning. It is a way to really differentiate the math because kids can come in where they're kind of safe. Um, I, see a, I see a picture, I see a 10 by 10 grid, or they can say, oh, this looks a little bit more like an area model. So it allows all levels to participate kind of on an equal playing field and be valued in their math thinking. This was definitely growth over time. Our math talks took a lot of work. Um, Beth came in and coached me through this. Is this okay? Are we doing this? Um, and what I found is that I had a huge increase in the participation of my students. When I was doing that direct instruction, I had a lot of kids sit back and, and nod. And when they're working in small group math talks, we really kind of set our norms and our expectations to say, you know, this is how you are participating. This is your expectation. And how do we give everybody the language to say, what do you think about this? This is what I'm seeing. How do you see it? To invite their peers in. And they really do take ownership of their learning. They're pointing to a concrete model. They're able to write up and share their thinking and explanations. And then they move on to that upper corner, which are the sorts. It's just a different way of exploring their thinking. And these are from the Math Empowered kits uh, the, um, that the workshops provided. So what they do is they take the math talks and then they take what we use is the problem sets or the gear sets in the Eureka Squared and put them into a little bit of different framework where they try to match up and they're actually solving the problems. My kids every day, is there a sort? Is there a sort? They're eager to engage both in the socialization about math and sharing their thinking. Um, and this, again, that helps with the differentiation. It also helps what I've seen over time is with their growth mindset. They realize that they're not always... Um, being judged on getting a correct answer, but they're like, oh, I see where I got that one wrong. It was right here. So they're able to go back and edit their thinking, which is what mathematicians do. And we speak to them all, as all mathematicians. As I go around and hear their math talks, and I was like, oh, I never saw it that way. And that it's really cool interactions because you have an insight of how they're seeing that a paper and pencil test may not show me all the time. And that helps me drive my instruction in math. Um, the math talks really help me drive down to the concepts. What are the big ideas for these lessons? And how can I help my students connect to their prior learning? And what can I get them to move up to the next step in their, in their growth? So I really do think they see themselves as mathematicians. Um, the social piece where they're able to talk about math. I mean, I was amazed when I stood back and I was like, wow, you guys are really good. Um, they gain a deeper knowledge and they're able to connect that learning where a big concept is right now the multiplication and division. And they're using associative and commutative property without really even thinking about it. And they have the confidence to speak as mathematicians to say, I see this this way. I'm going to multiply by the tens first or I'm going to skip count or I can double this and half it. So it provides a lot of the strategies um, that I'm looking for. And I was like, this, this is a great way to do this. So the growth mindset, the participation, the differentiation, um, and hearing them talk as mathematicians and learn that math is a process of editing and learning. And it's, if you don't have to get it right now, we're here as learners and we're gonna get some new information maybe the next day or from another conversation to apply to your next learning. So I've been really happy to be part of this process. So we do have a few other um, testimonials from teachers who weren't able to be here today.
Um, Michelle Nato, who's a fifth grade teacher at Bicentennial, who has actually been doing this work for the last two years, shared how it integrated with the new Eureka Math Squared. So this year, my class has started using the Eureka Math Squared. This program is easily complemented by our previous work with Math Empowered. Last year, I changed my math class routine to include many of the philosophies of math empowered and building thinking classrooms. Every math class begins with a randomizer in which students sort themselves into small groups with math card skills. They work collaborati collaboratively with their peers to ensure all students are grouped before they can move on. This fulfills two components of math. It ensures that students get exposure to fluency in math and typically introduces a part of the daily skill. These small tweaks to the beginning of the class have been monumental, monumentally helpful in pushing students to discuss math solutions and problems. The whole process encourages a culture of growth mindset as mistakes are made and corrected regularly without judgment. This procedural shift in my classroom has also pushed students to be inclusive of other students by, including, by encouraging group participation. The students have an opportunity to be on their feet while doing these tasks, which is a nice change from sitting in their desks all morning. Eureka Math, Math Empowered, and Building Thinking Classrooms have all provided my class with age-appropriate, engaging tools for math. And Stacy Kilgreen, a third grade teacher at Broad Street, shared her thoughts. This year, I've tried incorporating randomizers and dare problems from Math Empowered into my Eureka Squared block. Being new to Eureka Squared this year, I'm very happy to see how these two pieces can be used to enhance my lessons each day. I was apprehensive at first because I was worried the children weren't finishing problems on the sheet and were only doing a few steps. Also, I was having time staying away when they got stuck. As time went on, I was so impressed with their thinking and to see how when I gave them time to think and get stuck and unstuck, their growth was amazing. The children started challenging themselves. They completed as much of the dare as they could and then added more after a gallery walk. Students were very excited to tell the class their grow or an edit based on something they were taught the day before or that they tried, that they tried or something that they had seen on the walk. I couldn't be happier with the outcome. They are becoming such little mathematicians who can explain their thinking and help others improve their thinking as well. It was hard to release some of the control that let them lead their thinking, but this has proven to me that they, when given the opportunity with productive struggle, they can get unstuck. They help each other. Randomizers work perfectly to ensure a daily mix of student groupings. I love that. The experience with the components from Math Empowered surely has been a positive one. And then finally, we have some thoughts from Ashley Cataldo, a third grade teacher at Maine Dunstable. With all of the new curriculum that has been rolled out this year, I am confident in saying that we have received wonderful professional development opportunities to implement Eureka Math Squared and Math Empowered instructional practices. I was fortunate enough to do a math coaching cycle with Beth Wheeler to help implement components of Math Empowered into my daily math instruction. The transition in my instructional practice, practices has been significantly stronger and has helped my lessons to be more student-led. I have been a teacher in the Nashua School District for 11 years, and this is my first year where students are able to facilitate math talks while staying focused, connecting ideas, achieving learning goals, and feeling confident in their mathematical abilities. The, ma the materials provided through Math Empowered have been aligned to Eureka Math Squared to make sure that the key standards are being met and provide opportunities for students to share their notices and wonders. Materials for what comes next are prepared, materials for scaffolding, and materials to prove have all been laid out for us. This has helped tremendously when it comes to teacher preparation time. During one of my math talks, I even observed a student make a connection between prime factorization without even realizing it. This is an upper grade math skill, so being able to see one of my third graders assessing higher grade content through what they were already learning was pretty remarkable. It has also helped my third graders to build their confidence in getting stuck on a math problem and being able to work through it using their own strategies. It is almost inevitable if you are an elementary school teacher, that if a student, doesn't, a student doesn't understand a concept, we will run right there to the rescue. 
These mathematical and structural practices have helped me shift my mindset into thinking it will be okay to let the struggle of math happen. I am still there, however, taking on the new role as the facilitator. Getting stuck is the first step in the learning process, and these instructional philosophies have made a very positive impact on my classroom so far this year. I am sharing a positive mindset for continuing to implement these materials for the remainder of the school year and watching the growth that my third graders make as mathematicians. That's the end of our math presentation. Any questions? Is Julia? Thank you. Um, is is Beth Wheeler? Are you part of our school district? Are you here all the time? <laughs> okay, I, I should know that being here, sitting at this table. But I didn't know if you were a consultant yes. that only came time, you know, time and yes. time again. And and so th that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, I just want to make a comment that I'm sure they're all love loving being called mathematicians. I mean, it probably sounds to them like being astronauts, you know, versus okay, now we're going to do math, you know, so. The work they're doing in the classroom is the same work that mathematicians do. Mathematicians in real life collaborate. They get stuck, they get unstuck. They use mathematical tools to help them get unstuck. So it just seems to fit to call them mathematicians. Thank you all. Ms. Daniels Williams. Thank you. I love that they are working collaboratively that they're working together, that they're helping each other, and that I noticed that the teacher gets to look over them, but not unstuck them until they really need to be unstuck. So I really love that. Thank you for your presentation. Great, thank you. And and yes, I just want to say, so Beth Wheeler has been our elementary math coach for a couple of years, and I think that we can all um, attest to the contribution that she's made. Thank you, guys. Okay, great. So um, we have several educators here who are going to talk about the, the CKLA pilot that um, we are in the first year of. So with us, we have Patty King, we have Diane Merchant, we have Maureen McIntyre, we have Nicole Moody, we have Sarah Davis, we have Patty Flynn, and we have ELA coach who works with us and for us, um, Michelle Quadra Quadros. So our objectives for this presentation are really to, to provide continued education about how the brain learns to read. For three years, we've been talking about reading science, and I want to make sure that we keep um, providing some exposure when it comes to some of those key components that, were, that surfaced after the National Reading Panel report came out in 2009. We also want to make sure that we provide an update for the core knowledge language arts knowledge domain in grades five that we are piloting. And of course, we want to have our teachers share experiences about CKLA and what it has meant in their classroom. Okay, so this first slide um, is probably, well, they're all very important, but this has been quite a buzzword, the science of reading, this terminology. So what is it? It's, um, oh, I'm sorry, she already introduced me, so I didn't, oh, I'm sorry. Michelle Quadros, ELA peer coach. So um, the science of reading, or SOR as it's commonly referred to, is a comprehensive collection of research completed over many years by experts in the field of education, psychology, neuroscience, language development, and more regarding how we learn to read. Uh, it's not new, but it's new to a lot of people. And the neuroscience is very new to a lot of people. They don't actually understand how the brain uh, learns to read. So we're learning and more about that every day and trying to help our staff and our teachers understand that. So what it it is not is it, it is not a philosophy. It is not a fad trend or a pendulum swing as we often hear. It's not a one size fits all approach. It's not politically motivated and it is not a single component of instruction.
So next up, next up, we have Patty Flynn, who is the assistant principal. I was going to say superintendent <laughs> soon. The assistant principal of Maine Dunstable. Good afternoon. My name is Patty Flynn. I'm the, as Dr. Starkey said, I'm the assistant principal at Maine Dunstable. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about comprehending complex texts. Um, in the simple view of reading, um, there are several areas in the language comprehension domain that have to be present in order for reading comprehension to occur. And some of those areas are um, background knowledge, vocabulary, knowledge of language structure, including syntax and semantic relationships, verbal reasoning, for example, the ability to make inferences and to interpret abstract language, and then literacy knowledge, for example, the understanding of written text formats and how they vary according to genre. I'd like to share with all of you a piece of text on the next slide. And as I read it, what I'd like you to do is to think about what grade level you think this text was written for. The sound waves the ear collects travel through the ear to the eardrum. The sound waves make the eardrum move. Special nerves in the ear send signals to the brain. The brain listens to all of the sounds heard. The faster the eardrum moves, the higher pitch the sound heard. If the movement is slower, a lower pitch sound is heard. Any guesses as to what grade level text that might be? Third. It's actually a first grade text. And in order to understand the text, direct instruction in the language comprehension domains need to take place. And that may look like eliciting background knowledge, asking students, what do we know about sound? Doing some pre-teaching essential vocabulary, such as introducing the words sound waves, pitch, and collects. Asking inferential questions about the text, such as, what does the author mean when they write the sound waves travel? Or breaking the larger piece of text into smaller pieces for discussion and use of visuals to guide understanding, such as an image of the ear. It's also important to note that this would not be a piece of text that a first grader would be expected to read independently, but rather a piece of text that the teacher would provide robust instruction on in order to build vocabulary and background knowledge. CKLA provides students with robust, high interest text that promotes the building of background knowledge, vocabulary skills, and verbal reasoning skills. And today you'll have the opportunity to see how teachers in our district are utilizing the CKLA program. So one of the ans one of the questions that we want to answer is why have we ha why have we decided to pilot CKLA? So our next couple of slides and and our dis discussion will really focus on specifically why CKLA. I'm going to start with a little video. Um, this is. Uh, Principal Harrington from Fairgrounds Elementary School and Nicole Mazzi. They're just gonna talk a little bit about what CKLA is meant at Fairgrounds. So I'm here at Fairgrounds Elementary School with Principal Michael Harrington and Assistant Principal Nicole Mazzi. And we're going to talk a little bit today about the CKLA pilot. In the classrooms where teachers are piloting CKLA, can you tell us what you you what you have observed about the vocabulary usage, the content that's covered, and the tasks that students are engaging in? So we've had quite a few teachers that I have piloted, specifically in the lower grades. Um, the content, I, th I, th I think they're getting really deep uh, vocabulary. Uh, students are using uh, words appropriately when applying it to different content areas. Um, they're learning about like they're learning about civilizations and applying and learning between similarities and differences between different cultures um, and I think it's just really pretty amazing what they're doing especially in first grade second grade um, I think you've what have you seen yeah um, it, for example in second grade I had the opportunity to observe a classroom where students were engaged in a lesson learning about um, mer merchants and the Warhawks. They were studying the War of 1812 
um, and students were um, engaging in this debate where they were deciding if they were going to engage in the War of 1812, um, and regardless of if they were multilingual learners or had other learning difficulties, they were able to engage in this lesson. The teacher was walking around the room, um, helping them access the uh, vocabulary, the different parts of the lesson. And in the end, the kids were able to present to the class the reasons why um, with their persona, whether, whether they were a war hawk or a merchant, with the, the vocabulary, um, if they were gonna go to war or not. Um, and it was amazing what these kids were saying. Um, they even went back, and the teacher was explaining to me how she had to go back and teach them about the Revolutionary War before they were able to go forward and talk about that, so. I think they're excited to use some yep. of the words they're using too, and to use them like appropriately and apply them in the correct like circumstances. The kids get like excited about it, and it's kind of neat when you hear some of the vocabulary that's coming out of the mouths of kindergarten, first and second graders. They were in the lunchroom too afterwards, and they were saying how they were gonna engage in trade. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. love it. Okay, so I talk a lot about how federal law requires us to use evidence-based resources. And when we talk about what constitutes evidence-based resources, we're looking for empirically validated um, curricula. So when, when it comes to uh, student performance after we implement a, res a resource that is um, that has been vetted like CKLA, we would be looking for positive outcomes in student performance that we can replicate no matter who our student body is, no matter where it is that we are using this resource as long as, I mean, naturally there are variables, right? So assuming that the resource is being implemented with fidelity, there is um, really intensive professional development that's going on and we're looking for really effective of teaching, the student performance outcomes should be fairly similar whether we're in China, we're in Washington, D.C., or we're here in Nashua. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act is an act that was signed by President Obama in 2015, I believe. And um, essentially, when it comes to um, when it comes to evaluating our resources to be, uh, I, I guess, um, you know, like fall into this category of being evidence-based, there are four tiers that were that were established. And so after um, CKLA uh, had been used for a long time, it was initially created by the Core Knowledge Foundation. And the Core Knowledge Foundation really used E.D. Hurst Jr.'s work about why knowledge matters and how critical it is to build background knowledge and vocabulary in addition to those foundational literacy skills that we talk quite a bit about. And you'll see here that um, that CKLA received a tier one score because of the fact that it is uh, such a high quality resource. So I just want to, we will definitely send out this presentation. There are lots of studies. Um, what we're looking for when we look for, we're looking for empirically evidenced resources is we're looking for studies that are not funded by the publisher, <laughs> right? Because uh, they have a, a, an interest in this. Um, and so you can see, if you click on these links down here, it will bring you to many different studies and you can look deeply into the efficacy of CKLA. So Michelle Quadros is gonna read a testimonial by Jen McGee from Ledstream. So Jen tells us, CKLA has given my students a greater expanded knowledge of topics that they would have never learned about before starting this program. They have been able to learn about stories from all over the world, as well as learning about the world itself. This program really helps to combine both ELA standards, as well as social studies and science topics. Students are immersed in rich language and learning new vocabulary words in each lesson. My students have then been able to identify some of these words in other stories that we have been reading. 
even though these topics are higher level for my students, they are still able to grasp the concepts and are learning tons. And similar to what Beth referenced in her presentation, this is also the Ed Reports data on YCKLA. On this slide and the next slide, you will see that it meets the criteria for all three gateways. And with all quality materials, it helps us to start to really build those foundational skills in the primary grades that they will need as that our students will need as they transition from learning to read to handling more complex texts and comprehending those texts. Next up, Diane Merchant and Maura McIntyre from Mount Pleasant Elementary School will share their experiences. Diane Merchant, first grade, Mount Pleasant Elementary School. So. We are, um, we're focusing on the vocabulary piece and the multi Oh, can you not hear me? We're focusing on the um, vocabulary piece of CKLA and how um, accessible it is to our multilingual learners. And so I'm just gonna read each bullet and then um, Maura will add, she's a second grade teacher, first grade teacher. Uh, but it's nice because we're across the hall from each other, so we get to see that vertical growth, and we're constantly going back and forth and collaborating on what we're seeing and really blown away. So some of the same things that you've heard earlier in the presentation, because of a robust vocabulary is the foundation of effective communication and comprehension, CKLA is designed with specific vocabulary for each content. So just some things to think about is, uh, sorry, Maura McIntyre, second grade at Mount Pleasant. We're all learning through this program. There is so much that I'm learning, that the students are learning, that the other adults in the classroom. Um, and when we think about our EL and our SPED students, we want them using content language, not just conversational language. Um, you know, we talk about wanting them to be read to at home in their native language, because knowledge sticks to language and, and knowledge sticks to knowledge and they need to have some kind of an idea in their native language so that when we get to these tough concepts, they can be, a, be included, um, be engaged and just enjoy learning and not really knowing that they're anything different. They're just part of it, part of every bit of it. Uh, building background knowledge and front-loading lessons with targeted rich vocabulary prepares students of all abilities and backgrounds to understand meanings within the context of the subject. We see this unfolding nicely in the classroom with our multilingual learners and our students who have other specific educational needs. I don't know if you want to well, add to I, that. I think that everybody's talked about this. Any person who has mentioned anything, any testimony we've, testimonial that we've heard, something that I can speak to is in terms of background knowledge sometimes we have to correct it because I'll go back to War of 1812 I had a, a young boy who um, was all excited to know that we were going to study the War of 1812 because he had just read a book on World War 11 um, learning about ancient Greece and then all of a sudden two months later we're working in geometry and all the prefixes for the shapes are all Greek words. Um, that excites them. Um, talking about Greek, Greece again, learning about Athena and democracy, and then all of a sudden getting to War of 1812 and again having to give that background knowledge about how our country came into existence and you know, talking about people wanted to come here to, you know, believe what they wanted to believe in, elect their own leaders, make their own laws, and they're just saying, yeah, just like Athena. And it's like, you know, I feel like when I learned, it was the colonists came up with this idea. And here are these second graders saying, no, it was way back in ancient Greece. So making that connection on their own is amazing. Through active practice and engagement with CKLA vocabulary, students use their words in their discussions, writing assignments, and presentations. Um, uh, we are currently, we're also doing Amplify in first grade at Mount Pleasant, and um, another amazing program really 
gets to the nuts, nuts and bolts of, of the thinking process. And what I loved is they were, we were learning about this, in this term for Amplify Science, uh, we're um, sound and light engineers. That's our project. We have to figure out a way to solve the light and sound engineering problem at the puppet show. I'm getting, it's, I'm going to make a connection in a minute. So back to CKLA, uh, we're learning about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and how King Nebuchadnezzar uh, made these gardens for his wife because she missed her home, which was lush as opposed to the desert. So he had his top people come up with an idea of how to create these amazing gardens so that she could have something beautiful to look at that would remind her of her homeland. And the kids said, wait a minute, they had engineers way back when in ancient civilization? And I said, they sure did. And so they were making that connection. So it is really amazing how it is cross-curricular and how they are, you know, whether it's math or reading, or listening comprehension or science, they are making those connections. They're using the vocabulary in the correct way. And for our active kiddos, um, we act things out. We build things, work in teams. We build the we built the Indus River Valley and they were, you know, showing the Himalayas and showing the the Ganges River and how, you know, the snow melted and the and the spring monsoons caused fertile land. And, and it's just amazing. So you put them in groups and I don't think you could tell who the SPED student was, who the ELL student, they all have value. They all feel important. Um, they're all actively engaged and they love the presentation. And I've walked across the hall and seen your kids doing the same thing. And they want to show everybody. They want to take it on the road. Yeah. It is, it's been a really fun, it's amazing. A, a fun journey. With consistent active practice, multilingual learners along with students with specific educational needs can access content and apply their knowledge in the classroom environment and beyond. Um, and then our bottom line here is that it's, it's the rigorous vocabulary practices because it is pretty rigorous, coupled with best teaching practices and PD that the district offers and that we're reading. Um, it really serves all learners well. Um, they have yeah. the words now to, to do some writing versus years back, they didn't know what to write. And right. now they're, we've talked about it, we've acted it out, we've listened to it. Well, now they have that vocabulary, they know what to write. Um, it talks a lot, uh, they give a lot of examples with multi-meaning words in the sense of the word trunk. Is it an elephant's trunk? Is it a trunk you pack? Um, is it a life cycle stage or is it a stage that you perform on? Because our kids can get so confused when words have more than one meaning and it's all set up for you to explain to them which word you're talking about, which definition. Mm -hmm. So they're having fun, we're having fun. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. Um, but I'll tell you, at the end of my 12 domains, I am going to be killing it at um, trivia this summer because I have learned so much. Yeah. Yeah. And King Nebuchadnezzar, they can say that. They couldn't at first, but now they're Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the next video is it shows multilingual learners in the classroom. And I love this because the first one is, you know, we talk about that active practice and engagement. So the first video is two multilingual learners, one really She's still in the quiet phase, very quiet phase. Um, the one on the left is um, more proficient. So they're working on charades, vocabulary charades. You can see the words in the middle. Um, and then they're kind of prepping and they're going to, um, so in the first video you see them prepping, you know, and, the, and it's all in her native language, by the way. So uh, now she's gonna act out the word in the next video and the class is going to guess it. And I'm really loud, so you, there's no audio here, actually. I just, sorry. No, no audio there. Um, but I wish, I wish I had the audio because I must have, because you could hear her saying, coaching her in her native language. And this is going to be Go. loud, probably. Oh, what is she doing, everybody? Honey, honey. Honey, nice job. Uh, so they were trying to figure out how to, you know, show cunning in a, you know, secret, sly way. Um, and so we do this. We play these games and we do charades and we act them out and they work in groups to try to figure out what they're going to use to act out the word. And then this last video shows um, a student using one of the vocabulary words, I think, in context to the story. If 
like the old lady with a tiger, but it was actually, the, the tiger tricked the little girls that it was actually an old lady, but it was actually a tiger. And what was perplexing? Perplexing, it was confusing to, see, to notice if it was a lion, I mean, I mean tiger or a, a old lady. And what were the clues on the old lady's face? They, Do you remember? Because the clues on the old lady's face, she had um, amber eyes. Amber eyes, just like a tiger. And that was per. Flex. What's the word? Perplex. Perplexing. An example, and we do that ahead of every story. So it's it is there's a lot of front loading, but they need the vocabulary to access the content, and they're doing it. They're all doing it um, in their own way, but they're all making those connections, which is I love that. I'm certainly not going to take over Jimmy's job at any time soon. Sorry about the videos. Okay, so next up we have Michelle Moody, third grade at Fairgrounds Elementary. Nicole Moody. I say? Michelle. I'm sorry. I knew it was I knew it was Nicole Moody. You wrote Nicole, just so you know. Did I did. You know, I know I know she has to go and it's been stressing me out. That's why. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm okay. okay. I don't want to leave till it's done. This is going really, really well. Um I'm Mrs. Moody from third grade at Fairgrounds Elementary School. Um, we are right now in the end of unit four. We're a little bit behind, um, but not by much because as you've heard from everybody else, it's time consuming. And as they mentioned, there's a lot of front loading. And if you skip that front loading part, they're lost. They're completely lost. Um, so as much time as that takes, it's definitely necessary. And the fact that Amplify provides that for us and ways to make it engaging with all the students, even the ELL and the SPED students is wonderful. Um, I wanted to focus on the assessment parts that I've really, really fell in love with through Amplify. Um, it's, if you look at a unit and you skip right to the end and you're like, oh, I need to look at this assessment so I know what to teach the students. The assessments at the end, I'm sure you can all agree, are terrifying to look at. <laughs> um, but that's not the only assessment that they have throughout the entire unit. There's think pair shares, there's reader theaters, debates. My third graders in this picture, they put on a debate about whether Julius Caesar was a traitor, <laughs> a traitor or a hero. And it was the best assessment I've ever done on anybody. They went back and forth, they were engaged, they were respectful of others. They were proving their points, not just stating their opinion, um, backing it up with reasons of why from the text that we read. And we read four chapters on Julius Caesar, and they were recalling things that they learned the week before. It was remarkable. Um, and I did it twice, so I had um, eight kids go, and then we switched, and then eight more kids went. And the kids that didn't want to participate the first round loved participating the second round. Even if they just sat there and listened, they were still engaged and they were nodding their head like, yeah, I agree with that. And it was just, it was really good to see those shy kids come out of their shell and I was able to assess them without needing them to write something down. Because if they can tell me their thoughts and how they interpreted everything that I read to them or that they read in their partner readings or independent readings, that's fine with me. Their, their understanding and if their skills aren't there to write it down yet, that's okay. Um, next. Um, the compare and contrast systems of the body. This was another wonderful impromptu assessment that just popped up on the slides. And I um, had them work in partners and they had to come up with at least three or four boxes that they wanted to fill in. And then they got to go up and write it um, on a sticky note and stick it up on the chart. And then I wrote it on the whiteboard for everyone to see. And then the one next to it is um, a hanging anchor chart that I have in the classroom. So it's ongoing and I use it anytime I read some sort of heavy content um, material. And there to, they all have sticky notes on their desk and they write down the main idea that we talked about. Um, any, sometimes it's characters and traits. Sometimes it's uh, supporting details of the main idea. 
it changes, um, but they always have a heads up of what they're supposed to write down and it keeps them engaged. I know that they're listening because they know I'm gonna ask them to write something down. And then at the end, if they're, okay, I wrote it down, I don't wanna wait for the person next to me, they can get up and they can go stick it on the chart and that keeps their bodies moving too, which they're not bored. Um, so yes, I am a huge fan of all the assessments that go collaboratively into every unit so far that we've done. Thank you. And we're also going to hear from her teacher, friend at Fairgrounds Elementary, Ms. Davis. Hi, my name is Sarah Davis. I'm a second grade teacher at Fairgrounds Elementary. And like um, the other teachers on this panel, I have thoroughly enjoyed teaching CKLA to my kids. Um, an example right up here of how I have um, taken CKLA into my classroom is at our one of our first professional development courses that we took at the beginning of the school year, we were encouraged to focus on different areas of the curriculum. And I decided to make domain walls for my kids. Um, I have literally made this my whole personality in my classroom. And I have just loved seeing how my kids have engaged with this wall and how it has blossom to their learning. So the images that you see up there are given to us by CKLA. They are our image cards. And I have printed them out and added some blurbs to the bottom so that it's not only accessible to students who can read, but it's also accessible to those who might just need the image to jog their memory. I have, the CKLA has instructed us to for this unit, which was the War of 1812, to make a timeline. And then as you go through the unit, you add on the different um, image cards to the timeline. I also add a vocabulary component to the top of the board. And then along the side, the blue cards that you see are important people. And they were able to reference this the whole entire unit. It gradually went up and they used it not only for their daily vocab, but they also used it in writings that we did. And yeah, the, um, it just makes it visual for them. And what I love is that not only did we get the physical components of CKL, but we also got the online. So you're able to adapt to these images because I was nervous to cut up my image cards. So I didn't do that. Um, and I just printed them off and made them more unique um, for my kids to look at. This is our War of 1812 persuasive speech. When I first saw this in my teacher manual, I was like, oh my goodness, um, how are they gonna do that? And so I sat down one day and I was determined to have my kids do this. I knew that they were gonna love it. As soon as they heard what we were learning about, how we were going back to war with Britain, they were all in, they were ready to digest this material. And I really wanted them to enjoy this and be the launch for this unit. And so how we went about it was the first couple of lessons, they learned about what Great Britain was doing to us, how they went against some treaties, how they were not being nice to us. And we discussed it as a class within the, those lessons. And then afterwards, I broke them up into the two main groups, which were Warhawks and Merchants. And I split my class randomly down the middle. And I said, you are circling up and you are discussing what are the reasons we learned. So they collaboratively talked um, in circles. Then we came together, those circles shared out. And then what happened was I gave each student a sticky note and they went back to their seats. So their seats were filled with students who were not necessarily on the same side as them. They were able to collaboratively talk and students who were on the other side were giving them ideas. And so they wrote down on sticky notes each idea. And then in the first image, you'll see that they collaboratively collaboratively put them up on these anchor charts. And they are bigger in the center. I made those for them so that they could reference them when they went to go write their speeches. And so for their speeches, these were second graders. So sometimes they have a hard time knowing how to set up sentences or to write more than one sentence. So I decided that I was going to scaffold for them and I put on the board two different speeches. And what they did was they chose which side they believed to, that they belonged with. 
and they wrote their speeches accordingly and they used the sticky notes they could go up and take it off the poster and bring it to their seat and write down the reasons that they wanted to add on. And I brought actually some examples for you today to read, one from each side. Um, the first speech is from a merchant. It says, hi, I am a merchant. I oppose going to war with Great Britain. I oppose going to war because if we fight, we're not going to be able to trade. Also, we would lose our independence. And they broke the treaty saying we wouldn't interfere with each other's stuff. In conclusion, that is why we shouldn't go to war. This one is, this next one's very passionate. I'll tell you that. This is from a war hawk. Hi, I am a war hawk. I am in support of going to war with Great Britain. I support going to war because they broke our treaty. Exclamation point. Also, they stole our cargo. And they made a blockade. Also, they attacked the USS Chesapeake. In conclusion, that is why you should agree to go to war with the Warhawks and fight Great Britain. Exclamation point. She took some um, creative liberty with that one too. But they, they, and then you can see they presented it to the class. The ones who wanted to, I didn't force them. But they, they loved this so much. And by far, this was like the, the biggest, when I looked at it in my teacher's manual, biggest whoa, how are we going to do this? And by the end, it was my biggest love so far of CKLA. Nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. And I did want to make one other connection. Um, one of you mentioned about how they would take something that they learned in one unit and reference it back to another. And I have this little boy. He's the sweetest little guy. And he's one of my ELL learners. And we were talking about James Madison and how he went to the front lines with his soldiers when they were attacking Washington, D.C. And I said, does that remind you of anyone that James Madison went with his soldiers? And he raised his hand so far up in the air. I said, yes, buddy. He said, that's just like Alexander the Great. And I looked at him. I was like, Oh my goodness, yes, it is just like Alexander the Great. And to this day, I will call on him to make that connection because it was just a, such a wow moment for him. And no one else in the class raised their hand. It was just him. And these kids are truly making those connections with vocabulary. They're able to use that vocabulary. Um, one thing was that my vice principal came in and witnessed this, and she said that you could not tell what kids were special ed of which kids were ELL, they were all engaged and collaborative with it. They were able to talk with each other. Um, so yeah, it's, they do, they do really treat each other as equals and they love to help each other out so much in this. So I truly enjoy teaching this with my kids. Thank you. So unfortunately, because of the snow, um, we weren't able to have the folks from Amplify come in and discuss their product, but I do actually have a, a video, so I'll make sure that everybody gets that. But um, they flew in and they got to see our great weather from California and in, in Utah. Um, so that was a little upsetting. I, I got to connect with them yesterday, but they did. They do talk a lot about Amplify, the research behind it. Um, but one thing I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted is when we initially were talking about the knowledge domain, we learned that for grades K-2, there is a strong um, uh, oral reading and listening component to the, the K-2 program. And so, you know, a lot of folks were a little bit worried because they were saying, well, we don't we're not going to have books in kids' hands enough. And so um, one of the things that we learned about when we had a presenter come and tell us about the product is, well, a couple of things. One is the research tells us that our reading comprehension does not catch up to listening comprehension until around age 13. So if you're thinking about students who are developing foundational literacy skills, they're really hyper-focused on, I'm sure everybody who has kids knows, they're hyper-focused on sounding out words, right? Trying to become fluent readers, trying to make sense of putting all of the words together. 
So when kids are exposed to text and they're the ones who are reading the text all the time, it kind of limits the exposure and the ability to, to um, offer really engaging, rigorous content uh, to students. So this way, when students are listening to text, they don't have to worry about using, you know, their sort of cognitive energy to decode the words and make sense of all of them together. They can just focus on vocabulary. They can focus on content. They can focus on developing their speaking and listening skills. And so, you know, we have, um, we're building all of the skills simultaneously, of course, but I did think it was something that is important to highlight because the research is very, very clear that if we are going to read aloud to students, we should be reading texts to them that are several grade levels above what they can access independently. There we go. Um, so just a quick thing about CKLA. So CKLA offers a skill strand and a knowledge strand. Our district had, you know, spent a couple of years really becoming proficient with using foundations and then also mixing in Hegarty for phonemic awareness. And so one of the commitments that I made to teachers is that when we were going to pilot CKLA, we were only going to focus on the knowledge strand. That doesn't mean that teachers don't have digital access to the skills trend, and I've had a lot of teachers reach out to me and say, is it okay if I sort of, you know, marry the skills trend with some of the things that I'm doing? Because the, the phonics piece, it matches what is happening in the text. Like the, they're using a lot of the same um, content, and it, it, it just kind of all... Um, it all clicks when it comes together. So the skills trend, strand is available, but our district is solely piloting the knowledge strand. Except when you get to um, grades three through five, that that content is it's all integrated. So skills are embedded in the content building. And just like uh, Maura and um, Diane talked about, so there is a lot of vertical and certainly horizontal alignment. The goal is for students to gain exposure, you know, starting in K, and then you build on that knowledge as we progress through the grade levels. Sorry, some of these are CKLA slides. I thought they came out. Um, so I just wanted to also just mention that there, there are a lot of embedded supports for um, English language learners and also for students who have um, unfinished instruction. Sorry. Okay, I lost my slide. But for students who have unfinished instruction, there are pause points for um, emerging bilinguals. And um, there are also, like, kind of like Sarah was saying, you have the ability to really use images to get kids um, familiar with what the vocabulary words so that they can not just reference definitions, but also see the words kind of in action. I just wanted to bring to your attention that Caitlin Thomas is a grade one teacher over at New Searles School, and she shared these pictures with us. And so essentially, again, grade one, the students worked in groups to build models so, so that they could demonstrate their knowledge of all of the systems that they learned about. So you can see like the digestive process here, um, and this was really exciting for them. They also learned about early world civilizations, and so they were able to make papyrus paper just like the folks did in ancient Egypt when they wrote um, their name, in, and, they, and then they wrote their name in hieroglyphics, which was was kind of amazing. And just really quickly, Michelle Mills over at Ledge Street, I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted the work that she's done. Michelle, I would say, was one of those folks that wasn't really sure about this. <laughs> um, and then she started to really dig into the units, and she has, her classroom has taken on a life of its own. She, so this um, little guy down here is wearing basically a Zeus costume. And so when they were learning about Greek, when they were learning about ancient Greece, um, Michelle 
like became Zeus every single day. Her entire classroom, every single time a new unit is introduced, has just completely transformed. And one of the things that she mentioned to me when I happened to run into her one day at Lead Street was that she had the privilege of teaching students about um, different cultures and different beliefs. And she went to a, a, a wedding a wedding and the bride and groom came from India. And so she was able to see in real time some of the customs and traditions that her students in, in second grade learned about in terms of the, the Hindu faith. And so she happened to talk to some of the folks at the table that she was sitting at and she told them, hey, I'm actually teaching my students about this. And she said that one of the gentlemen actually approached her later on and thanked her because many of us have different beliefs. And a lot of times, we don't know some. We don't know about something. It might be um, if something is unfamiliar to us, we might not feel necessarily comfortable with it. So, by taking the time to really expose children to different beliefs and cultures and customs and traditions, it really helps us to develop an appreciation for everybody who's in our classrooms. We know that here in Nashua, we have, what, I think 60 different languages. We have children who come to us and their families come to us from countries all around the world. So this is just one way for us to just help students learn about the world. So unfortunately, Missy DeMeo and Erin O'Connell from New Searles are not here, um, but they're just doing really, really great things over at New Searles. Um, and so they said at the end of our plant unit, the students turn themselves into Polly the pollinator. They spend time buzzing around flower to flower, flower to flower, showing the process of pollination. And that kind of goes back to some of the acting out that our friends from Mount Pleasant were talking about. At the end of our five senses unit, we explored touch bags, taste plates, and smell tests. I wonder how that lime was. And so, um, so Missy and Aaron do have a couple of, of videos, but I'm just gonna play one for us right now. I'm gonna play the story so you can. Know. So can you tell me the story of the three little pigs? Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, the wolf like saw the pigs, and then, um, and then the wolf came and blew two houses down, and then he got to the last house, but he couldn't blow it down. Why couldn't he blow it down? Um, because it was made out of bricks. That's right. And then at the end, um, um. Uh, um, the piggy who built the brick house set a fire in his house, and then and then um, the fox went in the chimney, and he burned himself, and he didn't want to be seen again. Um, oh, sorry. All right, I'm going to do one more for the five senses. <laughs> Can you tell us about Helen Keller and what you learned? Um, Helen Keller doesn't have any sight or hearing cool. and you have a special teacher that's name is Anne Sutherland so she can so she can learn Yay. that's right and she uses her sense of touch a lot great job perfect <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about sorry okay so next up we're gonna hear about fifth graders from patty king I'm Patty King. I teach fifth grade at Maine Dunstable. I could echo everything that has been said to this point. I love CKLA. Um, it is exhausting. It's very robust. It's engaging. The kids are learning so much. Um, this is our first knowledge unit, if you will, on the Incas, Mayas, and um, Aztecs. And the students, uh, it all culminated in a comparative essay where they had to compare each culture. A little bit of research. Um, oh, Don Quixote, certainly an adaptation. They thought this was a riot. They really got into this uh, story. Um, nope, this wasn't. Nope. So with Don Quixote, they did a lot of um, comparing and contrasting as well. They studied the character traits. Um, they also studied the plot. Um, 
they're right now they're writing a story, The Adventures of Don Quixote at Maine Dunstable School. So it's, it's really, it's fun. It, it, it's just fun. The learning is fun for them. And like I said, they're, what they're learning is uh, substantial. It just feels more rewarding uh, to them and to myself as a teacher to sit next to them and feel that they're really learning something that's worthwhile. I was done? Okay. This is not mine. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I, I thought the next slide was Patty. I'm not actually sure who put this in here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think probably what we're seeing in this picture is kind of that, again, that horizontal progression, right? So kids learn about kids learn about ancient Greek civilization in grade two, and then they learn about, just like Patty said, the Aztec empire in grade five. And then um, we just heard from our friends in first grade who are learning about the human body and also the senses, and then it comes back up again in third grade. And so that's, that's all we have here tonight. But one thing I just wanted to note is that we were able to bring the pilot to Nashua because of a $300,000 literacy, lean into literacy grant that I was able to secure with the help of Michelle and other educators who helped me write the, the grant proposals. Um, we will, when we come to the budget meeting in several weeks, we will be talking about, you know, being able to finish out this pilot because we have, I would say a little bit more than half of our classrooms are elected to, to pilot these resources. We also had a lot of teachers and at fairgrounds, um, especially these guys now, a lot of teachers who kind of jumped on and said, wait, wait, can I, can I actually change my mind? I actually would like to do this. So we were fortunate and not, we were fortunate enough that we were able to let any teacher who wanted to jump into the pilot do so. Um, that's all I have. Any questions? Celia? Could I just add something anecdotally? Do we have time for me to? Okay, um, so I have a grandchild who's currently in first grade who last year was in kindergarten. And I've talked to, to Kimberly Sarfti about this a lot when we've been together. And so last year, and he's a child who um, doesn't seem to want to talk to you about whatever happened at school. I pick him up three days a week from the school bus. I spend a lot of time with him. And last year it was, you know, I, no matter how I phrase the questions, I couldn't find out what book the librarian read or what, you know. Anyway, um, but he learned successfully to read last year with whatever curriculum was in place when he was in kindergarten. He started out only being able to read stop signs and by the, the end of the year was reading to his younger sister. This year, however, in first grade, he gets in my car and starts with, do you know how many bones there are in the human body? <laughs> Calls in and tells me. Then, then he says to me, oh, I have to show you. I learned how to write my name in hieroglyphics. And I said, well, where are hieroglyphics from? He goes, Grandma, Egypt. Will you take me to Egypt? I'd like to see the pyramids. <laughs> And it, it just goes on and on and on. And so, I mean, he talked about the, the, the um, fairy tales from different, you know, company, from different countries around the world and how they all had the same theme. And this is a child who I heard nothing all of last year about whatever happened in school. I mean, I had to just intuit it. Um, so it's kind of, you know, whatever we did last year, we did really well. But now this kid is like just blossoming with CKLA and um, he's, you know, reading labels on food that he eats now. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable to me. So I just wanted to share that. So I, I love the idea of the curriculum. Um, I was wondering what um, subjects exactly are covered with the reading vocabulary. So, um, so like the different topics you mean? Well, so, I mean, I certainly could share that with you. There are, there are a lot of different topics that are covered, um, but there, there's a, a big emphasis on learning about the world. So, you know, early civilizations, obviously there are science, 
there are science topics that are embedded into um, into the units. There are a lot of, I guess, social studies type talk to topics that are that are embedded into the units, so that we take more of a humanities approach. That we don't necessarily have to reserve some classroom time for like the traditional, you know, social studies uh, period, right, where we open up a textbook and we learn about facts and things like this. The, the structure of CKLA allows kids to really engage and kind of like be part of history. Like Nora was talking about transforming her, her classroom into the Indus River Valley, something I also did, by the way, many years ago. Um, but there are, there are certainly a variety of topics and, and you can see, so I certainly can send that to you and you can see how they build over time. I think it's awesome how interactive it is and everything. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, guys. I, and I just want to obviously say that we have the best teaching staff anywhere, right? And I, I think it's pretty apparent that these guys are so incredibly dedicated to their students. So thank you. Just give me one sec. So I do have, while I'm trying to find this video, I have a, um, I just wanted to talk really quickly about our professional development day that is taking place. Excuse me. Our professional development day is taking place on January 23rd, and um, the theme of the day is staff choice. So what we did, I worked with our coaches, um, and I, I surveyed staff members to find out exactly what type of professional development they wanted to engage in. So we have opportunities for everybody. Um, this is strictly for the elementary level. So um, teachers are able to develop their own personalized learning plan and they can do that by writing up a proposal. It's just like a form and then they send it to their supervisor. Um, but additionally, we have CKLA, uh, additional CKLA training for the day. We have Math Empowered and some of those kits that Beth, Beth was talking about. Monica Tino and Patty Davidson, they created a ton of asynchronous uh, workshops for teachers to be able to log in and then apply what they learn with their own um, science instruction. So this is something that I think people have been really, the feedback about these workshops has been really positive because not only are teachers logging into these workshops during our PD days, but I see them logging in at you know, on the weekends at, at, at all different hours. Um, we also have a lot of teachers in our district who are engaging in letters training. And letters is essentially, um, letters training is really, really deep training about how the brain learns to read. It's very intensive, as Michelle knows. I also am taking letters training. But letters is actually funded right now by the state of New Hampshire. And so one fun fact that I wanted to offer is that there is another round of letters training signups that will be available very soon. I'm not sure if the window's open yet, but any educator, parent, community member, anybody from the state of New Hampshire is is eligible to sign up. Yep. So that's a fun fact. You do have to basically commit you know, to sign your life away, and you have to say that you're actually going to fit, you're going to finish everything. Um, but there also is a stipend that is available to teachers if they are able to complete the training. How many hours have you worked on this so far, Michelle? Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm I'm in year two for the admin training, but I'm also layering on the elementary or the teacher training as well. Um, and then just really quickly before we get back to Janelle, I just wanted to share that we had a presentation that was delivered on January 4th by Brent Conway. Brent Conway is an assistant superintendent in Massachusetts um, for Pentucket Regional School District, but he's also in the literacy world, one of the most notable presenters kind of everywhere right now. He's not, he's all over the place. If anybody signs up for the Science of Reading Facebook pages that every teacher I think in the country is on, um, Brent 
runs one of those pages and he's able to kind of rub shoulders with some of the, the literacy experts that we've been talking about for decades. So that was really exciting for our district. We've had him come before. And then when he came on January 4th, he really talked about kind of what it means to build a multi-tiered system of support that focuses on prevention instead of intervention. Like, we don't want to have kids who can't read and then have to intervene. We want kids to read from day one, right? Like, obviously not day one, but like from, from when they first come to our school, we start building those literacy skills and they want them to be proficient rather than having to intervene. Um, and then I really hope that this video works. So my friend, thank you, thank you, my friend Janelle um, Archer is somebody that we worked, excuse me, somebody that we worked very closely with during her time at the Boys and Girls Club, and our district was very, very fortunate to be able to um, have her join us for the 21st century director position. I'm so sorry. Yes. I apologize. I might actually have to, I, I, I apologize. I the, the link that I have attached to the CNE um, agenda is not, for some reason, it's not working. Um, oh, nope, here it is. Okay, so um, just really quickly, Janelle's going to provide a, an update about the 21st century program. And um, I can tell you that she's been working really, really hard to ensure that the lessons and the content that um, is being offered to our students during the after school portion is directly aligned to the content that we're teaching in the classroom to offer the extra layer, layer of exposure. Yeah, it's, it actually turned off. Okay, all right, so we can listen to Janelle next time. I apologize now that the technology here is not working. Um, but I will just say that Janelle has been working. Okay, I will say that Janelle is working really, really hard too to make sure that that the summer program that she offers for our students is the most robust that it has ever been. So she has been collaborating with a couple of folks from the YMCA because they're the ones who collaborate with us to have power scholars um, during the summer months. But it's okay, I think I'll play this video next time. It's definitely worth watching because Janelle is probably one of the best speakers I've ever seen. Um, but just know that the students who are engaging in our after school programs are definitely in good hands. She's hired wonderful staff members um, and I just can't say enough things about what's been going on with their programs. And that is all that I have for you today. Ms. Giglio. Could I just add that um, it's, it's only a few weeks ago that we decided to have the PD day next Tuesday versus the third week in February. And looking at all the offerings, I have to congratulate you and your staff for what you've been able to put together that appeals not only to teachers but powers. I mean, it's, it's really amazing what you put together. And so it seems to be something for everybody. In fact, it's probably going to be hard to choose which to which to apply, which to do. But thank you, I, I appreciate that. I will say too that our unified arts teachers always lean in, and they're always willing to make sure that they have opportunities for the the other the UA coordinators who are basically our teacher leads at the elementary level. Always willing to lean in and offer some something for the unified arts teachers. And then with regard to that power professional training, I was able to. To connect with um, with Joey Nichols from the state. She's the person who runs our Title II grants, and she she's the state is offering this three two one training, and it really has to do with like social emotional. Um, the focus is really on like social emotional needs of our students, and that is free of charge for any district that participates. So we were able to leverage it and then have them come in person. And fun fact, fact, all of our professional development opportunities on that day for elementary will take place at Sunset Heights Elementary School. And I would just like to thank the staff there for opening up the school. Um, they might not love the fact that we're in some of their classrooms, but they did it with a smile. So that's a great thing.
Do we have a motion? We don't have any motions. We just want to give updates and share how good our district I, is. I had a different motion in mind. <laughs> for a motion to adjourn. I'd be looking for a motion to a adjourn. A motion that we adjourn. I second that motion. <laughs> and the motion passes. Good night, everyone. We are adjourned at 541. Thank you.